Hi, I'm Yurai Tanaka, and today I'm going to talk about haptic source effector, my latest work that I did in collaboration with Jacob Surfiti and my advisor, Pedro Lopez, at the University of Chicago. So this user here is immersed in virtual reality. Wow. They feel the force feedback in their hand for being hit by a projectile. They can even feel this in their foot. So today's goal is to find out how he was able to feel all these sensations while he wears nothing on their hands and feet. So let's start where we are today. Every time when we are in need for haptic feedback, we design a device that we attach specifically to a target body part that the user should feel the sensation. So in this way, for, insta for instance, haptic gloves were designed to create sensation in the user's hand. The same way haptic actuators worn on the arm are for force feedback to their arm. Similarly, device on the curve to create the sensation at the curve. Or even foot-worn devices to provide sensations even on the user's feet. This approach is very intuitive, as in the users need to and should feel stimuli in these skin areas where these devices are attached. And those are the very endpoints of our nervous system that processes haptic sensations. So we call this approach end effector, or in the term from robotics. But unfortunately, this approach will not scale up to create sensations to the user's full body, because if we want to do that, the user will be heavily instrumented by numerous different devices attached to different parts of their body all around the body. So today, I'm going to propose a completely new way to provide haptics that breaks away from this idea of endpoint actuation. But to understand my proposal, first, I want to dive a little bit deeper into what's happening in this end effector approach. So here's an example. A user with a haptic device on their hand to feel the sensation in that location, and the device operates a mechanical stimuli and let's see how they feel the sensation. Well, this mechanical stimuli applied by the device, for that, there are the receptors underneath the user's skin that convert these vibrations or skin deformation or force feedback to electrical signals that get transferred to the nerves inside the hand related to the spinal cord and all the way to the brain. And it's only at that point when the signal has reached the brain that the person feels, oh, something's happening in my hand. So if the brain is where all these sensation signals converge, what would happen if we forget about endpoints end and skip all these endpoints and only stimulate the brain, the source? So that's the concept I'm proposing today, haptic source effector. So let's get back to our original theme Ooh, turn out, out what this person wears Here we go. is our brain stimulation device that leverages transcranial magnetic stimulation, which is a non-invasive brain stimulation technique established in neuroscience using an electromagnetic coil energized by a stimulator that is currently off the screen. So at this right moment, when the user should feel this recoil of a shooting a projectile, this coil creates a magnetic field that stimulates the corresponding brain area, creating touch and force feedback in the hand. And none of these sensations are coming from the skin, but instead directly created at the brain. So now, when the user gets another projectile on their foot, the brain stimulator has now been moved to a different location and this time, they feel in the foot. As you have just seen, this single device on the user's head was able to switch between two areas, the hand and foot, and generate sensations, although these two points are very far apart. And again, he's, he wears nothing on his hands and feet. So now, let's see how our source effector can actually reach to even more different brain areas and create sensations across the user's body.
So here comes my colleague, Aki, wearing my device, our device, and what we are going to do is our device moves this coil across the span of Aki's brain cortex, and we stimulate different regions of his brain and see what happens. So let's first start with moving the coil to this area. And I stimulate. As you can see, Aki's left form all the way to the hand moves. And this is because this area of the brain right beneath this coil is responsible for the sensation and movement from his left arm. And that's the principle. And now, let's move this coil to another location, this time around, to the brain area that corresponds to his left foot. And again, I stimulate. In the same principle, you saw it, his whole leg now moved and he felt the sensation in this area. Now let's switch the side. Now I could move the sensation, uh, the coil, the brain region that corresponds to his right foot. And his right foot twitch. Lastly, you I even move this to the ear corresponds to the right hand. And you also saw that Aki's hand moved and sensation he also felt. By controlling this position of the coil robotically, we were able to create like all these sensations across all the rims. And this is based on that this section of our brain's, uh, brain cortex corresponds to the sensations from our entire body. Sometimes we call homunculus. Okay. So now, as you may be wondering, we indeed formalize what we just did and investigated how many different sensations our current implementation of social factor can create. So we defined nine points on participants' right side of the sensory motor cortex and stimulated each point while modulating the stimulation intensity. And what we found is that we observed participants' involuntary body movement, which is false feedback, occurred in these six regions even including their jaw. We also found that participants felt touch sensations without any movement in two locations, which are hand and foot. So we observed the, the total of eight different sensations within one side of the body, which obviously doubles for the other side, so 16 sensations across the entire body in total. We also found that these effects in different body parts are quite evenly distributed across the nine stimulation points on the brain, which means that our device should be, at least be able to adjust the position of the coil smaller than the, this like, unit distance between these points, which is 8.5 millimeters. So again, let's get back to this area and let's talk about our device. So you can see, this is, uh, this is our device, the stimulator. And you can think this is our uh, robotic actuator, uh, robotic device. And first and foremost, our device features two main motors that moves the coil in two, uh, in two axes. Like you can see, this rotational servo moves the coil left and right. And this linear actuator moves the coil in turn like front and back. And these primary two motors ensure that the coil can move across the entire region that covers up the sensory motor cortex. But importantly, we have another axis, which is this axis, that can create the coil to tilt on top of the user's head that ensures that the coil it's flush to the user's head that is very important for our technique to work. And these are the primary components that are extending from this back of the uh, VR headset device, but to support the weight of this coil and then these motors, we have an extra mounting point at the front of this VR headset that is directly screwing, uh, screwed onto this device um, the mechanically. 
And also, the main components, the frame of our devices, device is are the, these passive rails and bearings that ensure that while we are moving this coil, the whole device can seamlessly slide across and seamlessly move the coil. So all in all, we evaluated that our device can robustly move the coil within the required precision of 8.5 millimeters. Thank you so much, Aki. Okay, so now we took that device I just talked about and put it actually on people's head and let them experience our virtual reality application, which was our second user study. So our participants experienced the walkthrough that you just saw in the beginning of this talk, feeling and shooting the projectile in the hands and feet, and even stomping onto a virtual box to collect more ammunition. And here comes the reaction. As you can see, people really enjoy the interactions. And we found that our new way of creating sensations directly from the brain was positively appreciated by the users. And they also mentioned it added to the realism of their experience, despite the current form factor of our device. All right. So today, I propose haptic source effector, a new concept of creating haptic sensation by directly stimulating the brain. As opposed to conventional haptics and effectors, our approach allows us to reach many points across the body from a single device only sitting on the user's head without instrumenting users with many devices in different locations. Haptic source effectors is also the latest and most extreme version of my vision for intercepting the nervous system. For instance, previously, I created touch sensations in the user's fingers and the palm by only having the device on the back of the hand, which I presented last year in Kai 23. Or my Kai paper from 22 presented our approach to move the user's head without any robotic instrumentation on their head. Or with my magnetic st muscle stimulation, which I presented in last year's wrist, you can stimulate the muscle without wearing anything on the muscle. So for these, all these works that like stimulating nerves, naively, you might think that haptic source effector can rule them all because the brain is the source of the older nervous system. But it turned out there's a deeper difference between stimulating nerves and stimulating the brain. For instance, if you think about the spatial resolution of the sensation, there's an interesting trade-off. Although from the back of the hand, I was able to create a more than 10 locations uh, of the sensation within the hand. As we're going further away from the hand without instrumenting it, the nerves are getting more and more bundled, so it gets more and more difficult to create the sensation specific to smaller regions. So at the end of the day, when you're at the source, the brain, where the density of the neuron is the highest in the body, as you saw today, we ended up creating only one single area of the sensation in the user's hand. So probably the technology will advance for both of these approaches, but this kind of trade-off, which is fundamental, attributed to our anatomical feature, should be kept in mind. And there is more room to explore, which I'm excited about. And with that, I'd like to conclude my talk today. And thank you for listening.